I just returned from a, a trip to Philadelphia and also Washington, D.C. We did an outreach to the inauguration and to the Women's March, and then I spoke at a church on Sunday. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't record the message, and so I'm recording it here now for everyone uh, with the online audience. And so let's, uh, let's start in prayer. Father, I just pray that you'll speak to us uh, through this message today. I pray, Father, that you'll move hearts, Lord, that you'll set us a, a flame for you. Father, we love you. You're welcome here in our uh, hearts. Father, you're welcome here in our uh, meetings and gatherings. Father, we, we love to be in your presence, and I just pray that you'll touch us with the anointing of your Spirit, Lord. Uh, you've done so many good things in my life. You've done so many good things in our life. I just pray, Lord, that we'll always speak well of your name in this world, Father, that you'll always be on our tongue as we proclaim the gospel, Father. I just pray that the body of Christ will rise up in holiness and in righteousness to proclaim the word of God with boldness and without fear in this ever corrupt and depraved world, Father, that you will uh, combat the darkness with the light by using us to save souls, Lord. So we just, uh, we love you and we appreciate you and we pray in Jesus' name. Name. Amen. And so, like I said, I spoke at a church in uh, Philadelphia, and the, the great thing about this church, it's, it's not only a new church, it's only been around for about eight months, and it's already growing because the pastor is a street preacher who also goes door knocking, and he's, uh, he's not just trying to steal sheep from other congregations, he's getting new families and new converts to come and join his church. Uh, and, but the Bible says, you know, if the salt loses its savor, it's therefore uh, good for nothing good for nothing but to be uh, tossed out and trodden underfoot by men and so the a lot of churches in America today are, the, are the good for nothing churches. They don't witness, they don't evangelize, they don't add new converts, they don't win souls, they don't confront sin, and they're the good for nothing church. And so if you can find a church that actually goes out and witnesses and shares the faith and evangelizes, well then you found a real rare church indeed. It's a, it's a diamond in the rough. A lot of churches, you know, mega churches that have large choirs uh, large worship teams and yet little to no evangelism team, little to no outreach team. And that's uh, absolutely a shame. You know, when we go and we preach out in front of the gay uh, pride parades, uh, you don't see any, uh, you know, you don't see many Christians out there witnessing, usually just uh, us, you know, and whatever, whoever we brought with are the ones that are out there witnessing. But uh, in the parade, you'll see all sorts of churches that are supporting the homosexual agenda and the homosexual parade. You see all sorts of churches that are marching in the parade. And you're, you should never complain about something you're unwilling to uh, change. And there's lots of, you know, pastors and lots of churches out there that complain about all the social sins of society, like abortion and homosexuality sexuality, but very few that actually get out to the abortion clinics and the gay pride parades. And so, uh, you know, people ask me a lot of times, how do you find a good church to go to? You know, I'm, I'm not a pastor. Uh, sometimes I get emails from people who uh, want to treat me like, you know, a pastor, you know, with counseling and that sort of thing. I, I'm the type that just calls sinners to repent, you know. I've been asked to uh, pastor different churches and I've turned them down because uh, it's not my calling, it's not my heart. You're supposed to have a shepherd's heart to, uh, you know, counsel families and that sort of thing. And uh, it's just, you know, I want to be out on the street corner uh, calling sinners to repentance. Uh, but the great thing about the church church that I spoke at there in Philadelphia was that the pastor hates sin. You know, people ask me all the time, how do you find a good, uh, good church to go to? Well, you know, there might be a great denomination with a bad pastor, and there might be a, a bad denomination with a good pastor. What, what makes the church really a good or bad church to go to is the pastor himself. Is he a good man? Does he hate sin? Does he love Jesus? Does he urge people to prayer and to holiness? Is he out on the, the streets witnessing and testifying for the Lord? You know, it's all about the pastor. And so the great thing about, uh, you know, this uh, church in Philadelphia that I spoke at was the pastor truly uh, hates sin and he preaches against sin and he calls people out of sin and so what I'm preaching uh, to everyone today about is five keys to living a holy and sin-free life 
this is a rare message. You know, a lot of times you'll hear messages of, oh, the five keys to financial freedom or the five keys to the blessing of God in your life. You know, the uh, five ways of having your best life now or, you know, all of those types of messages. You don't have many messages on holiness, which is why I preach it so much, because it's a repeated theme all throughout the Bible. And since the Bible preaches holiness so much, I'm amazed that many preachers don't preach holiness at all. In fact, a lot of times when pastors preach about holiness, they preach against it. They just label anything uh, that might be, uh, you know, holy or sin-free, they just label that as Phariseeism or legalism, and they just tell people, you can't stop sinning, you're a sinner, you're going to sin until the day you die, there's nothing you can do to overcome sin, so uh, just don't feel bad about it. The only freedom some of these pastors offer is not freedom from sin, but freedom just from the guilt of sin, uh, freedom from feeling bad over sin. And that's not the type of freedom that Christ offers. It's not the type of freedom that you should have. If you're sinning, you should feel bad about it. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts you of your sin. And if you don't want to feel bad about it, then stop doing it. And so that's the type of freedom that Christ offers. Uh, biblical salvation is not just deliverance from the uh, punishment of sin or the penalty of sin, but, but deliverance from the power and the practice of sin. As the Bible says, uh, you shall uh, call his name Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. Salvation is not primarily deliverance from hell, but deliverance from sinning. And it's only deliverance from hell because it's deliverance from sinning. If salvation was deliverance from hell, without deliverance from the sin itself, then salvation would become simply uh, a license to sin. And that's a counterfeit salvation. That's a counterfeit Christ, a counterfeit grace. And that's what is being preached and taught in the vast majority of American churches today. A counterfeit salvation that leaves sinners in their sin but delivers them just from feeling bad about it. So that now they, they go to hell thinking they're going to heaven. They sin without feeling the conviction of the Holy Ghost anymore, and that's a very, very dangerous thing. And so we have to start with defining what is holiness. Five keys to living a holy life. Well, what is, what is a holy life? Okay, well, in the Bible, you see, like in the Old Testament, there were uh, items in the temple, like bowls or cups, uh, those sort of things that were considered holy. Well, how can that be, uh, how can you have a holy bowl? How can you have a holy cup, you know? A cup and a bowl is not a sentient being. It's not a moral being. And holiness is thought of as a moral attribute. Well, holiness is a moral attribute in man, because man is a moral being. But holy simply means to be set apart, okay? Uh, the bowls were set apart to the service of God. They were separated from every other use. They were set apart for the service of God in the temple. So they were considered holy bowls. And if you're going to be a holy man, it means you are set apart from sin and dedicated to the service of God. And if you're not set apart from sin and dedicated to the service of God, you're not holy. There's only two types of people in the world. Those who are holy and those who are unholy. Those who are saved and those who are unsaved. And every man serves some kind of purpose. And if you're, serving, uh, if you're not serving God, then you're serving the devil. If you're not dedicated to the purposes of God, then you are dedicated to the purposes of the devil. And so everyone is either holy or unholy. And to be, to be holy, you know, is not a, a, a half-hearted or uh, incomplete thing where, you know, you can be half-holy, half-unholy. You're either dedicated to God or you're not. You're either committed to God or you're not. You know, when I got saved 16 years ago, I submitted my life completely to God. I yielded my will 100% to God. It's like a light switch. You're either on or you're off. You're either obeying God or you are disobeying God. But in the past 16 years, I have grown. 
in my knowledge. I've grown in my understanding of the will of God. I've grown in my understanding of the purposes of God. I've, I've learned more things. I've acquired more skills. I can render a greater service to God now than I could 16 years ago. And so holiness is not uh, the idea that you have no room to grow in your life. You can be 100% holy and still have a lot of growing to do because your knowledge is yet undeveloped. Your knowledge is never uh, complete. You, you don't have an infinite understanding of God and of His ways or of everything that you could do for Him. We're, we have finite minds and so we're always going to grow. And that's how you perfect holiness in the fear of God. Holiness is complete. You're either holy or you're unholy, but you're still growing in your knowledge and therefore growing in the service that you can render to God and we're you know I'm tired of, of, of dumb Christians you know Christians who really don't care to study or to think uh, God gave us our mind and he intended for us to use it God gave us our intelligence and we're commanded to love God with all of our heart soul mind and strength and so as Christians we ought to be the most educated people in society because we're obligated to love God with all of our minds, not just obligated, but we actually do love Him. So why wouldn't we want to learn all that we can do for Him? Why wouldn't we want to learn how we can service Him better and minister unto Him better? And so, uh, yeah, we need to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So when, when you're holy, it means every part of your life is dedicated to God. Your, your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength, it's all 100% dedicated to God. That's what it means to be holy. Your time, your money, your energy, your thoughts, it's all dedicated to God. That the, that the glory of God is your primary purpose in life. Not like most people, unregenerate people, where the primary concern of their life is self-gratification. The primary concern of their life is how they can pleasure and please themselves. But when you're regenerate, when you're born again, the primary concern of your life, the primary objective or object of your life is to bring honor and glory to God. And so how, how, do, you, how do you live holy? You know, uh, first of all, holiness is not optional. We read in Hebrews 12, 14, says, Follow peace with all men, and uh, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Some people seem to have this idea that holiness is optional. Uh, holiness is for the mature believer. That it's something that you progress into. And that's not right at all. It's not that, like some people think, oh, you get saved by accepting Jesus as your Savior, and then later you decide whether you want Him as your Lord. That, oh, sanctification is a process. You know, you might, you might give up drinking this year, give up smoking next year, and then the fornication, murder, and adultery, well, you might give that up decades from now. You know, because sanctification is a process. No, no, no. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And so if you're not holy, you're not saved. There's no such thing as an unholy Christian. In fact, the Bible calls Christians saints. And the word for holy and the word for saint in the Greek New Testament are identical. It's hagios. It's the same exact word. When the Bible says Christians are saints, it's literally saying Christians are holy. So when it says, be holy, it's actually telling you, be a saint. So it's not optional. It's not just for these mature believers who've been in the faith for many, many years, many, many decades. No, no, no. It's for every believer to completely yield their life to God, to dedicate themselves to God, to be separated, wholly sanctified, separated from sin, and dedicated to the services of God. And so uh, that's what holiness is. So the five keys to uh, living a holy life, number one, starting with the basic fundamental, is free will. You have to have free will because holiness in man is a moral attribute and all moral attributes must be chosen. God cannot create in you a moral attribute without your cooperation and consent. And God gave Adam and Eve a, uh, a choice in the beginning in the garden between good and evil. 
God say God put them in the garden with the tree of life there. Why? Or I mean the tree of knowledge. Some theologians will try and tell you that the tree of knowledge was there because God wanted them to sin. And that's blasphemy. That's heresy. God didn't put the tree there because he wanted them to sin. He put the tree of knowledge there because he wanted them to have the opportunity not to sin. He wanted them to have the opportunity to be tempted and yet to overcome it. That they might choose good over evil. Not so that they would choose evil over good. And so there has to be free will. And God gave us that free will in the beginning. And that free will has not been lost. Despite what many theologians will try and tell you that, oh, it's Adam's fault, blame Adam, our free will has been taken away, and now we're just born sinners. We're going to sin every day of our life. We're going to sin till the day that we die. And that's a damning, damning message. That's a, that's a damning falsehood. How did God deal with Cain after the fall of Adam and Eve? He said, sin lies at the door, and his desire is to have you, but you must rule over him. And so Cain, despite his, uh, well, his forthcoming sin, evidently had the ability to rule over sin. So the freedom of the will had not been lost. See, at the end of the day, when it comes to living a holy life, it comes down to a matter of choice. And there's no trick. There's no, uh, no quick and easy way. You know, when at, at, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is the fact that you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted every day of your life. And you have a choice to make. And that choice must be done by your own free will. I remember as a new convert just praying, oh God, just, you know, force me to be holy every second of every day. Just force me to never sin again. Force me. So that temptation I can't, that I can't even be tempted anymore, just force me. What a silly prayer that was. You know, I felt God say, no, no. If you want to be holy, you need to choose it. If you want to overcome sin, you need to choose it. At the end of the day, it is a matter of choice. And the Bible says God gives us that choice. You know, the worst limitations of all are self-limitations that people put on themselves. These imaginary boundaries where the devil comes and says, you can't do that, you can't live holy, you can't overcome sin. You're born a sinner. It's your nature. And it's the same defeatist attitude that you hear out preaching at the homosexual parades. They say, I was born this way. It's my nature. I have no choice in the matter. It's just my orientation. And it's the homosexuals who don't believe they can change who never do change. But the homosexuals who believe they can change are the ones that do. And the same applies to every other sin, to every other drugs or alcohol or anything else. If you don't believe you can change, you won't. But if you believe that you can, then you certainly can. The Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is past, the new has come. And the Bible says, God never allows you to be tempted above that which you are able. And with the temptation, he always provides a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. That you might be able. In other words, ye are able, it says. Ye are able to bear it. So this question of ability, do you actually have the ability to overcome sin? Of course you do. You were created in the image of God. Do you really have a choice between good and evil? Of course you do. God gave you a free will. And so key number one to overcoming sin is to choose not to sin. And if you choose never to sin again, guess what? You never will. And if you sin again, it's because you chose to. The Bible says His commandments are not grievous. In other words, uh, they're not impossible. His commandments are reasonable expectations upon us. Given our abilities, given our knowledge, uh, holiness is to really obey God to the best of your knowledge and the best of your ability. And if you're obeying God to the best of your knowledge and the best of your ability, then you are sin-free. You are holy. But every day it's a choice. You're never... Uh, free from temptation. You, the Bible promises you can be free from sin, but you're not going to be free from temptation. 
Even Jesus Christ was not free from temptation. Jesus Christ was tempted. And so we must uh, make a daily choice to be holy or not. A daily choice to sin or not. The Bible not only talks about a sinner who turns from his sin unto righteousness, the Bible also warns about a righteous man who can turn from his righteousness and go back to sin. You can forfeit your salvation. You can backslide into sin, according to the Bible. Well, key number two to living a, a holy life is the fear of God. You see, free will is not enough. With our free will, what have we done? We've sold ourselves into slavery to sin. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. You see, by our free will, we became sinners. Now, we could have overcome sin, but we didn't. We could have chosen God over the devil, but we didn't. Every one of us, at the age of accountability, chose sin over righteousness. We chose the way of the devil over the way of God. And so it takes more than just, uh, just the, the ability to choose good over evil. There has to be influences upon that will. And the Bible says, By the fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. And if our society ever needed the fear of God, it needs it today. If you see how rampant sin is in our school system, in our, in our you know, Hollywood entertainment, in our society, in our nightlife, when you see how rampant sin really is in our culture today, it's because our society and our country has lost the fear of God. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. And so if society is embracing iniquity and living in sin, it's because it has departed from the fear of God. Now what do I mean by the fear of God? Well listen, fear is fear. Some people try and downgrade fear and say it just means reverence and respect. But the Bible says to serve God in reverence and godly fear in the book of Hebrews. So there's, there's both reverence and godly fear. Jesus said, don't fear man who can destroy the body and then can do nothing more. Ah, uh, but fear God, he said, who can destroy body and soul in hell. Well, he's not just saying reverence. Oh, reverence God, who can destroy body and soul in hell. Respect God, who can destroy body and soul in hell. No, that's terrifying. That's horrifying. God is the most terrifying person in all of the universe. He's not just the most loving, he's the most terrifying. He, he so hates sin, he so loves righteousness, that he burns the wicked alive forever because of their sin. He is horrifyingly holy. Yes, he ought to be terrifying to us. We ought to fear him. We ought to tremble at his holiness because he hates sin more than we can comprehend, more than we can imagine. He says, bring those enemies of mine that would not have me to reign over them and slay them before me. He says, bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Our God is a terrifying God. Great and terrible is the Lord. Great and terrible is our God. So, so Jesus preached the fear of God. I wonder why so many preachers don't preach it at all. The fear of God is a repeated theme all throughout the Bible. And since it's a theme of the Bible, every preacher of the Bible ought to be preaching the fear of God. America needs to get back to the fear of God. The churches need to get back to the fear of God. Ministers need to proclaim the fear of God. Not just that we should fear Him, why we should fear Him. He kills people. He damns people for eternity in hell because of His estimation of sin. Because he, he so hates and despises and abhors the wickedness of men. And when you fear God, and you walk in the fear of God, you'll live holy. The Bible talks about men like Job or Noah who fear God, who feared Him and hated evil. 
And as a result, the Bible says they were perfect men in their generation. So God should be feared because God deserves it. He deserves your fear. He says, don't fear man who can destroy the body and then can do no more. There's plenty of people that fear ISIS. They, they, they fear gangs. They, they fear uh, violent men. But they don't deserve your fear because they can destroy the body and then they can't do a thing more. But God, Jesus said, God can destroy body and soul in hell, so fear Him. Fear God because He deserves it. Key number three to living a holy and sin-free life. It's not just choosing by your free will to avoid sin under the fear of God, but also under the love of God. He is not only the most terrifying being in all of the universe, He is the most lovely. He is the most lovable. The Bible says that we love Him because He first loved us. He demonstrated His love for us at the cross. When you look at the cross of Christ, you not only see how much God hates sin, how much He hates wickedness, but how much He loves the sinner. And since He was willing to go through so much to save us and to rescue us from the bondage of sin, from the damnation of hell, from the service of the devil, from the corruption of this world, we should love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now there's lots of people who say, oh, I love God, I love God. They say that while I'm preaching to them in their lines trying to get into the bars. In, well, they're saying, oh, I love God, I love God, while they're dressed in their uh, clubbing outfit trying to get into the club. Okay? That's not the love of God. That's a counterfeit love. That's just a feely, feely, soft, sentimental, emotional, oh yes, I feel like I love God. No, love is a committal of your will to promote the well-being of somebody else. And if you really love God, you're not going to want to sin against Him. If you really love your neighbor, if you're full of the love of God, you're not going to want to sin against your neighbor. Because nothing hurts more people than sin does. Sin has an absolute natural tendency to misery. Whereas holiness and righteous living has an absolute natural tendency to the highest well-being and happiness of all. And so if you really love God, you're not going to want to blaspheme His name. You're not going to want to dishonor Him. You're not going to want to, uh, you know, defame His Sabbath, to uh, rob God of the time and service that He deserves from your life. You're not going to want to worship some false god, because sin grieves God. Sin hurts the heart of God. The Bible says every man either pleases God or displeases God. By the things that you do, by the choices that you make, by sinning or not sinning, you're either pleasing or displeasing to God. So if you really love Him, if you really love Him, then you're going to want to keep His commandments because you know that pleases Him. You know, God is the greatest victim of sin in all of the universe. Nobody has ever been sinned against more than God. Sin doesn't hurt anybody more than it hurts God. And so if you really love God, you will refuse to sin. If you really love God, because when you're sinning, when you're choosing sin, you're choosing not to love Him. And so uh, we should love God because He deserves it. Once again, it goes back to this point that God deserves it. He deserves our obedience. He's never sinned. He's been sinned against more than any other being in all of the universe. And yet he himself has never sinned. So he deserves our love, our loyalty, our faithfulness, our obedience, our dedication. He deserves it. Key number four to living a, a sin-free and holy life is to hate sin. Like God hates sin. The Bible says, you that love the Lord hate that which is evil. 
If you love God and you see that sin hurts God, you'll hate sin. And if you don't hate sin, you don't love God. Now, in our society, hate is painted with such a broad stroke that people think hate is always bad. They say, love, not hate. Love, not hate. But if you love sin, that's a bad love. If you hate sin, that's a good hate. If you love righteousness, that's a good love. If you hate righteousness, that's a bad hate. So it's not that love or hate are just in and of themselves good or bad. It depends on what is it that you're loving? What is it that you're hating? And that determines whether your love is good or bad, whether your hate is good or bad. Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Hebrews 1, 8 to 9, Jesus Christ loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Jesus was sinless. He never sinned. He said, come and follow me. I have given you an example to follow. And yet he hated sin. We not just need a revival of the fear of God in our society. We need a revival of the hatred of sin. Sin deserves to be hated. Nothing has ruined more families than sin has. Nothing has ruined more relationships than sin has. Nothing has hurt more children or more adults than sin has. Nothing has hurt God more than sin has. Sin is the worst thing in the universe. Sin is why angels are damned. Sin is why men are damned. Sin is why Jesus died on the cross. It's sin. Nothing is more worthy of your hatred than sin. You know, what is it that killed Jesus? It was our sin that killed Jesus. It wasn't even the cross. When you die of crucifixion, you die of suffocation. But Jesus didn't die from suffocation because he cried out right before his death, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. So if Jesus didn't die from from suffocation or from crucifixion, what did he die from? Well, when the soldier pierced his side and outflowed what seemed like blood and water, that's what you would call post-mortem evidence that the heart of Jesus had literally ruptured and blood poured into the outward uh, pericodium sac around the heart. And the blood began to coagulate and separate the serum, the red, from the clear. And so when he was pierced on his, pierced on his side and that pericodium sac was punctured and that, that uh, sac was released, so it, you see blood and water flowing out, that shows that what Jesus literally died from was not crucifixion, but a broken heart. He died of a broken heart. When Jesus was in the garden and he prayed, he was under such mental agony, such torment of soul, that he, he began to sweat great drops of blood. That shows mental anguish. And that mental anguish literally ruptured his heart when he was on the cross. So that, as even one of the Psalms says, that says, uh, Jesus uh, says that he has a broken heart. And that's how Jesus died. And so sin has broken the heart of God. We not only see that in uh, like Genesis chapter 6, before the flood, that sin broke the heart of God, but you see that even on the cross, that it was our sin that broke the very heart of God, and the rejection of the world that broke the very heart of God, and that ended and terminated His life. And so we ought to hate sin. And if you don't hate sin, that's moral insanity. You know, people love their sin. And it's like they're embracing their murderer with open arms. They love it. And they want to embrace it. They want to keep it. They want to continue in it as long as they can. And when you see sin for what it really is, you see how deserving of hatred it really is. That it's moral insanity to love your sin. It is moral madness to love your sin. Because nothing hurts more people than sin does. Nothing ruins more lives than sin does. And to embrace it and to love it and to cherish it and to fight for it and to defend it is absolute moral insanity. But you see that even from the pulpits today. Many preachers who will, instead of attacking sin, they attack holiness. And instead of preaching holiness, 
and defending holiness, they defend sin. And you have these doctrines and theologies that come out of Bible colleges and seminaries that say you're born a sinner. You're going to sin until the day you die. It's just your nature. You can't help it. You can't stop it. And they have such a high view of sin and a low view of the grace of God that they say you can never overcome. But it's holiness that needs to be preached and holiness that needs to be defended and sin that needs to be attacked high and low. And churches, many churches have it backwards. They defend the sin. They give you theological weapons to defend your sin. And they attack holiness as Phariseeism, legalism, and all the rest of it. So we need hatred for sin. If you love Jesus, you'll hate sin. And if you hate sin, you will fight against it. You will resist the temptation. And the Bible says if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. You, de you develop habits. You know, holiness ultimately becomes a matter of habit. Anything you practice becomes a habit. How do you get good at anything? It's through practice, practice, practice. I used to have a habit Friday nights was party night. We'd get off school, we'd go buy some drugs, buy some alcohol, get together with some girls, and we'd party Friday nights. But when I got holy, when I got saved, Friday nights, uh, you know, became a, a well, it was a temptation because it was a habit, it was a routine. But instead of going out, I'd stay home and pray. I'd stay home and fast. I would stay home and read the Bible and get closer to Jesus. And eventually, you know, I'd start going out street preaching Friday nights, Saturday nights, and I'd be preaching in front of the bars, preaching in front of the clubs, and the furthest thing from my mind would be to go into those places. It wasn't even an idea in my mind. It wasn't even a temptation anymore. So you develop holy habits. Anything that you do on a daily basis will become a habit. And you can either have holy habits or unholy habits. It's ultimately a matter of your choice. But rip the mask off of sin and see how heinous and, and insidious it really is. How devilish and demonic, how destructive sin really is. And then hate it. And number five, the fifth key to living a holy life, a sin-free life, is faith. The Bible says this is what overcomes the world. Even our faith. The Bible says faith is what purges and purifies the heart. It's our faith. Jesus, the Bible says it's our faith that God imputes as righteousness. It's faith. Faith is the most powerful thing in all of the universe. Faith overcomes sin. And what is it that the devil attacked when he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden? He attacked their faith in the Word of God. He attacked their faith in the character of God. The devil came and said, Oh, has God really said you can't eat from this tree? God really said you couldn't eat from all the trees in the garden? Oh, it's only because he knows if you eat, you'll become like him. Oh yeah, God's holding back on you guys. God is, God is withholding something that's good for you. You should choose to disobey God because it'll be good for you. And it's the same lie and same deception the devil uses today. People somehow think that sin is going to benefit their life. That sin is somehow going to improve their life. And it's the exact opposite. Nothing leads to destruction. Nothing tends to misery more than sin does. And the devil comes to you and puts a mask over sin. Says, look how lovely this is, how wonderful this is. You'll be so happy if you do this. This is going to make your life so much better if you do this. And he ruins you. And he ruins your family. And he destroys our societies. And he brings damnation to our world. See, everybody trusts somebody. You're either, when, when you're obeying temptation, you're trusting the devil. But if you say no to temptation, then you're trusting God. So your faith needs to be put in the character of God. He came that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. 
So don't put your faith in the devil. When the devil says embrace this sin, choose this sinful lifestyle, and he's trying to paint a picture in your mind of how happy you'll be, how wonderful it will be. No, no, no. Rip the mask off of sin. Don't put trust in his heart. Don't put trust in his character. He's lying to you. He's trying to deceive you. He's trying to hurt you. Put your faith in the character of God. God deserves it. He demonstrated his love for us on the cross. And you think, oh, saying no to this sin, you know, having a life of self-denial instead of a life of self-indulgence. That, oh, that's going to, you know, you're going to be missing out on all the pleasures of the world. Oh, you'll be missing out on the damnation of the wicked is what you'll be missing out on. And so, you need to put your faith in God to overcome sin. Don't believe the lies of the devil. That sin is somehow going to help you. Sin will somehow make your life better. Put your faith in the character of God. So, you know, what does it mean to have faith in God? Lots of people say, oh, I, I have faith in God. Well, there's such a thing as dead faith, demonic faith. The Bible says faith without works is dead. A lot of people say, I believe in God, but they live lives of sin. That's completely incompatible with true and living, active, obedient faith. Because if you really trust God, you'll do whatever He says. Just like a soldier at war, if you trust your commander, you'll obey his orders. If you trust the captain, you'll do what he says. And when you really have faith in God, it means you'll obey him. And the proof that you have faith in him is your obedience. And if you're not being obedient, that's proof that you're not truly trusting in him. Now, it's a daily choice to trust him or not. Moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, we choose to trust Him or not. But everyone is trusting someone. Everyone is trusting in something. Everyone. And so faith is a radical thing. Faith is not passive. Faith is life-changing. Nothing has changed more lives than faith has. Just like you can say nothing has destroyed more lives than sin, nothing has changed more lives than faith. Faith in the character and goodness of God. So much so that you obey Him and do whatever He says and keep His commandments by faith. That's what it means to be justified by faith. The Bible says we are justified by faith. That means you're made righteous. That faith in Christ will actually make you a righteous person. Just like Job, who had faith in God. He feared God. He hated evil. And he was, the Bible says God boasted of Job to the devil. Have you considered my servant Job a perfect and an upright man? That's the power of faith in the character of God, in the goodness of God. Faith in the commandments of God. The commandments of God are like a fence. A fence is uh, meant to... You know, be a, a barrier of protection to keep the bad out. And that's what the commandments of God is. God's commandments are a barrier of protection to keep the damage of sin out of your life. I love the commandments of God. If a man hates the commandments of God and loves their sin, they are morally insane. They're not thinking rationally. But if you love His commandments... Because you see the good that they do for your life. And you hate sin because you see the damage it could do for your life. That's moral sanity. That's when you're thinking rationally. Holiness and reason, rationale, are, com per are perfectly compatible. They go hand in glove. They're both from God. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, well, sin is a bad idea. Keeping the commandments of God, that's, that's a good idea. So God, we should put our faith in God. Uh, he, he is worthy of it, and He deserves it. And true and living faith. You know, a lot of people claim to be justified by faith, but very few claim to be sanctified by faith. But the, according to the Bible, the same faith that justifies 
is the same faith that sanctifies. And so if you're not sanctified by faith, that's absolute proof you are not justified by faith. If you're not obedient to God, that's proof you don't have faith in Him. The same faith that Abraham had, whereby he was justified, is the same faith Abraham had, whereby he obeyed God. That he was willing to sacrifice even his firstborn, to do whatever God commanded him to do. The Bible says, by faith Abraham obeyed God. And so a lot of people claim to have Abrahamic justification, who do not have Abrahamic obedience. And that's a falsehood. You're not justified like Abraham unless you are obedient like Abraham, who is obedient by faith. And then you could say there's like a number six, the sixth key. Even though this teaching is the five keys to uh, holiness, the five keys to living a holy and sin-free life, there's a sixth key, which is really all-encompassing. It encompasses all five, and that's the grace of God. The grace of God. The Bible says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So how do you know if you're under law or under grace or not? Are you sinning or not? If you're sinning, you're under the law. The law condemns you. If you're not sinning, then you're under the influence of grace. Grace is having its proper influence in your life. The law is not condemning you. And so how do you know, are you, are you under law or are you under grace? Well, are you sinning or not? Are you living a life of sin or not? The Bible says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. So the grace of God is a holiness teacher. The grace of God teaches you to live holy. And if you're not living holy, then you're not listening to the teachings of grace. You're still under law. You're under the influence of law. Just a matter of, uh, you know, fear of punishment and pursuit of pleasure. That's all law. But when you love God and you want Him to be honored, Him to be glorified, you'll refuse to sin. You'll be under grace. And so how do you know if you have, how do you know if you're under grace? Well, when you're under grace, your life will be purged of sin. You'll be living a holy and sin-free life. And if ever you choose to sin, at that moment you are resisting the grace of God. Nothing is more resisted than the grace of God. And you got these theologians who preach about the uh, irresistible grace of God. It's irresistible. It's a bunch of, of foolishness. It's nonsense. Nothing in all of the universe is resisted more than God's grace is resisted. As Stephen preached in the book of Acts, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. A wicked man is resisting the grace of God. When you're feeling convicted of your sin and you're feeling guilty of your sin and you resist that, you're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. You're resisting His grace. Yeah, it's by the grace of God that your free will is being influenced towards righteousness. It's by grace that you fear God. It's by grace that you love God. It's by grace that you hate sin. It's by grace, grace that you have faith in Christ. It's the influence of grace. Grace is the divine influence upon the heart. So that if you choose to sin, you blame yourself. It's your own free will. But if you live holy, you give credit to the grace of God. So that you say, I am what I am because of the grace of God. On my own, I made myself a sinner. On my own, I made myself wicked. But through the conviction of the Holy Spirit through the illumination of the scriptures through the regeneration of God I became holy and it was an act of grace on his part and his divine teaching and illumination upon my heart the grace of God taught me to live holy and so you know ultimately it is a matter of of choice at the end of the day if it were all of God some people put all the responsibility on God. If it was all of God, everyone would be holy. Or, when you sin, you could blame God. So there has to be, obviously, this element of cooperation and consent. 
Uh, otherwise, God would be responsible every time that we sin. But the Bible says, uh, you know, that God's grace has appeared unto all men. And so if you're not living holy, it's because you're resisting His grace. If you're choosing temptation uh, over righteousness, if you're choosing the devil over God, then you're resisting the grace of God. The Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? And so by grace we overcome. And so the Bible says, you know, our God is a consuming fire. When I got saved 16 years ago, my mind went from being occupied with all sorts of wickedness and all sorts of sin to suddenly my mind was occupied by God. When God takes his residency inside of a human being, God, God starts to live inside of you. He occupies every aspect of your life. I, I, I would wake up thinking about God. I would go to bed thinking about God. I, and all in between, I was thinking about God. God was in all of my thoughts. Unlike the wicked, where the Bible says God is in none of their thoughts. No, no, no. When you get holy, you get saved, you get sanctified, God consumes every aspect of you. He consumes your thought life. He consumes your energy. He consumes your time. He consumes your money. He consumes your life. That's what it means to be entirely sanctified. It means every aspect of your life is being touched and dominated by God. That every aspect of your life is, is set apart from sin and dedicated to the service of God. That's what it means to be entirely sanctified. And oh boy, does the church need that more than ever. We need an army of entirely sanctified, holy believers who will love righteousness and hate sin, who will confront the wicked, rebuke their sin, call them out of the darkness and to come to the light. All to Jesus. All to Jesus. That's not, that needs to be our motto. Take my life, as the hymns say. Love so amazing and so divine demands my heart, my life, my all. So, amen. Let's live holy. Let's be the saints of God in this present world that we were called to be, that God always wanted us to be, that God will help us to be if we will just completely yield ourselves to Him in the fear of God, in the love of God, in the hatred of sin, and in faith in Christ by free will and grace. Amen? God bless you guys.